there's probably three dynamics. Okay, there's probably about 100 dynamics, but I'm going to focus on three dynamics that heavily influence the effectiveness of choice in the pension fund benefit context. And the first one is really, do people really understand what the right target is? The second one is, and it really gets down to the whole issue of savings, what stands in the way of people understanding the importance of savings? And the third one is, how we communicate to people, how we frame the problem, how we educate people. And these three different dimensions are incredibly important to really pull apart and understand in better detail. So let, let's start with our first problem. Now consider this, for you as an individual to be able to determine what is the best choice for you to make that will serve your interest in 30 years time, whether it be an investment decision or a benefit decision, you have to have a full knowledge of what kind of health you're going to have over that period, what sort of family or lack thereof you're going to have over that period, where you're going to be living and under what kind of circumstances, what's going to be happening to your job, and will you have increased your salary or decreased your salary, the complexity of the problem simply resides beyond the scope of most individuals' ability to get to the right answer. It's incredibly complex. That's why we give it to actuaries, these smart guys over here. But oddly enough, the very people who you think would be able to make the decisions and this is people like myself, financial professionals, lawyers, accountants, you know, consultants, also turn out to make the very worst decisions. In fact, if you look at the evidence in this book, you'll see that professional services ranks lowest in terms of where they end up with after the journey. So what does that tell us? It tells us an important thing, that financial education isn't the answer here. This is an emotional problem that people face, and that problem ties back to the inability to really envisage 30 years from now what the life is that you're likely to retire into if you don't do X, Y, and Z. Now think how most benefit decisions are framed. You're given a form to fill out, Somebody sitting there, usually an HR director, or it comes over the internet, this is usually more the case these days, and you're told, fill in the blanks. Back to Shina Yenga, how do you make the decisions? How something is framed at you will determine your choice. So there's a wonderful exercise that says, if I put two items on the table, and ask somebody to make a choice between them, or a choice of some combination of the two, what will they pick? Half and half. If you put three items on the table, they'll pick a third, a third, a third. And it goes on and on like that. So just by putting choice out there doesn't mean we're helping our employees. If anything, we are hindering them. And that gets me back to the how do we address this problem? And it's back to the paternalism issue. And it's back to the role that the employer plays. Because only through that formal engagement in the employment contract can, do we have an opportunity to really save the individual from themselves, <laughs> effectively. Do we have an opportunity to recognize that not everybody needs exactly the same benefits at the exact same time in their lives as each other. That there has to be some kind of flexibility if you really want to make the solution as efficient as possible for the individual. And that really gets down to a very almost paternalistic role that we have to play in terms of structuring that answer for people. So what's the answer? The answer isn't to take choice off the table. That's far too extreme a gesture. 
the answer is to recognize that choice for its own sake in something as complex as retirement funding is not optimal. But nor is inflexibility. So in a way, we were right to add flexibility into the dynamic of benefit structures. But we were wrong to leave all the decision making to individuals. And that really takes me back to the role of the employer because he plays a critical role here in terms of trying to develop what become default solutions. Now the reason why I say default solutions is because people can always opt out of defaults if they have good reason that they can show for why they do not need to follow the default. But the default solution can embed in it enough flexibility, enough dynamism, enough recognition that all the levers have to be moving in a synchronized, efficient fashion if we're going to extract as much out of these investments and these solutions as they're capable of delivering without having to depend upon the markets at large.